Hello, everybody. This is uh, Reverend Macon, Dr. Macon, President of the United Pastors. Welcome to Martin Luther King Day. Uh, we're just so excited to have you today. Uh, and we've got a marvelous, marvelous service. Uh, this is the time to celebrate Martin King uh, Day. So we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to open up with an opening uh, video, and we'll move forward. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for Martin Luther King Jr. and the marvelous work that he has done. We thank you for his vision and his dream, and we know that the dream continues. Now, God, we pray for our nation and the words that Dr. King left us with regards to uh, our context today. Bless us now and all of those who are watching us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna look amen. at a video at this time. Uh, One hundred years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. generations we have known of knowledge's infinite power yet somehow we have never questioned the keeper of the keys the guardians of information unfortunately I've seen more dividing and conquering in this order of operations a heinous miscalculation of reality ye have heard that it has been said thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy I say unto you love your enemies bless them that curse you. Dr. King was the passionate voice that awakened the conscience of a nation and inspired people all over the world. I have some very sad news for all of you, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight know that a lot of people fought hard and a lot of people uh, died uh, to ensure that we as a people move forward and not backwards. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Self that, that all men, men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Don't just aspire to make a living. Aspire to make a difference. If I have learned anything, in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope. The power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. It matters not your gender, your ethnic or religious background, your orientation or your social status. Our struggles in this world are similar. 
and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward, changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. We are one people, all of us pledging allegiance to the Stars and Stripes. In spite different culture background, different religious faith, or different race, we're all the same human being. Now let me say finally that we have difficult days ahead, but I haven't despaired. Somehow I maintain hope in spite of hope, and I've talked about the difficulties and how hard the problems will be as we tackle them. But I want to close by saying that I still have faith in the future. And I still believe that these problems can be solved. And so while the law may not change the hearts of men, it can and it does change the habits of men. We will be able to hew out of the mounting of despair, a stone of hope, this faith. We will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and live together as brothers and sisters all over this great nation. That will be the day when the morning stars will sing together and the sons of God will shout for joy. Thank you. Dr. Moss, are you on? If you unmute, Dr. Moss. Uh, I'm on. Dr. Moss, we're so sorry. Um, uh, I heard that you were not going to be able to stay with us the entire time. Uh, and so uh, we want you to share with us uh, your words of wisdom with regards to Martin King and the context that we're now living in and the, the expected uh, problem that we may have in the next day or two with the uh, capital and the uh, violence that are going on in our response as pastors. God bless you, Dr. Moss. Uh, thank you, uh, President Macon, and to all of our uh, sisters and brothers on this call. It is an honor to share uh, these special moments uh, and these fleeting years. Uh, for those of my generation, it is difficult to believe that if Dr. King were alive today, he would be 92 years old. Uh, his work was done in the context of a young prophet, dead before he was 40 years old. One or two things I would like to lift up, <clears throat> and I would strongly urge that we read, reread, and study the writings and works. Of I, was, I, would, I would strongly urge that we read, reread, study, and re-study not just books about Dr. King but the writings and publications of Dr. King himself. Uh, it is good to get those perspectives of individuals who have done research, who have uh, delved into the context of 
the age in which he lived and worked as well as those around him and all of the forces that had some impact on the work that he was doing. But Dr. King left us with a treasury, a rich heritage of his own writings and speeches that we ought to make primary in any of our research quotes, etc., and interpretations about him. One of the pieces of material that I have referred to constantly is found in a very short personal letter Dr. King wrote to Mrs. King when he was in the Reedsville Georgia State Prison. It's a very short, personal, powerful letter. And I have used it in many sermons and speeches and in all of the seminars and courses I have been privileged to share or conduct on the life and work of Dr. King and almost all of them I have referred to Dr. King's letter from the Reedsville, Georgia State Prison, October 1960. Time will not permit us to go through that letter. Uh, it starts out in a very personal and affectionate uh, greeting to Mrs. King with the greeting or salutation, hello, darling. And that greeting or salutation alone speaks volumes uh, when we take into consideration the circumstances out of which he was writing Mrs. King and the circumstances surrounding his family and the injustices that caused him to be in solitary confinement at the Reedsville State Prison in the state of Georgia, mid-October, really late October, 1960. And this experience of imprisonment, this experience of injustice, this experience of sacrifice and suffering impacted, yea, shifted the outcome of the presidential election in 1960. There is one line in that letter that is prophetic, absolutely profound, moral, spiritual, and visionary. He says, I believe that the suffering coming to our family now will somehow serve to make Atlanta a better city, Georgia a better state, and America a better nation. Just how, I do not yet know but I have the faith to believe that it will. Amen. Go, go, go right here, Dr. Moss. I'm sorry. Several days later, that prison experience shifted the outcome of the election of the president of the United States. 
Mm -hmm. And today, we have experienced the election of a black Baptist preacher from the Ebenezer Baptist Church to the United States Senate and a Jewish dedicated individual also on the same day, first time elected to the United States Senate. And some 60 plus years later, we see the fulfillment of the continuing fulfillment of Dr. King's prophetic leadership, even his spiritual and prophetic beliefs and proclamations being fulfilled at this very hour. And that's just one line in that short letter. We could talk about some of the rest of the letter on another occasion. Thank you. To uh, King's Day. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother President, brothers and sisters, good morning, and uh, happy Monday and happy King Day. Um, <clears throat> it's always interesting that um, uh, to try to find words when I'm sandwiched between two of my great mentor teachers. Uh, so I will probably be as brief as I've ever been in my life. <laughs> uh, but that is to say that... Um, you know, um, when I look at the challenges that uh, we have as peoples, uh, different ethnic groups, as well as a nation, um, and I look at the coalitions that were formed over the last uh, 50 years that seem to be significant, and uh, uh, the last 14 days, we've seen the hope of America and we've seen the darkness of America. We saw the hope of America in Georgia uh, with the election of those two senators in a state that hadn't been blue for more than two, two and a half decades uh, with regards to electing, in the, electing someone in those positions. We saw the darkness in, of America on uh, January 6 uh, and prior to that, uh, when those senators and congressional people stood against the Electoral College, which we discovered in government years ago was who elected the president, but it was made more visible in 2000. And so to see elected officials literally deny the Constitution, deny the will of the people, and ultimately the Electoral College was a very dark day for us. And then to see that exposed further with the uh, insurrection on our capital, capital was another dark day. But the question I've been wrestling with is how these coalitions have been able to fly up under the radar screen in the name of conservative religion, in the name of white nationalism, in the name of white supremacists, in, in the name of the Confederacy, in the name of uh, moral majority, and all of these various names, how this coalition could continue to progress over the last 50 years. So the thing that, that I wanna say about King, he said, give us the ballot box. We saw the power of all of those who don't believe in voting, all of those who think that it doesn't matter. We yeah. saw him say, give us the ballot box. We saw that power. Remember, whenever black progress and black potential moves forward in this nation, it recoils. And it recoils in a very violent way. And so the violence we saw on January 6th is the violence that we've seen ever since we've been on this continent. It may be new to some people. <clears throat> it may be different to some people. And we can go back and, 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 re and recount history from reconstruction forward. But it doesn't matter because from day one, the Puritans who came to this country looking for a better life, looking for an opportunity in the name of Christ, said from the first day that we arrived in this country, we will save them. 
We will win them to Christ, but they are still slaves. The spirit of that thought has been the spirit of this nation for now more than 400 years. The last 200 years, we've seen great manifestations of it. It's only simple that we read our Bill of Rights, that we read the Voter Rights, that we read the Civil Rights Act of 1870, not just 1964. When we read the language of those bills, we see the rhetoric of January 6. No change in rhetoric. The only difference is it can spread much faster now and much differently. So I would just say to us today is that if there's one task we have, and that is to, to, to mimic Georgia, because uh, when I woke up that Wednesday, I called my cousin who lives there to ask her if I could have space in her garage so I could move down there uh, and be where the action is. But um, I think that it's important for us to understand the vote. Um, if you listen to King's speech in 57, uh, if you listen to it in 63, 67 and 68, it is almost as if the prophetic voice that we need today is still among us through his witness and his writing. I believe that the left and the right, the white church and the black church has some serious reckoning. We have reckoning because our people are confused. We have reckoning because it's gonna take a powerful spirit of repentance on our part for some things, on their part for other things. And I believe that hate exists in this country because love is hid in houses of worship. I believe that hate exists in this country because the love that Christ gave us is not being spread abroad and to our neighbor. The flesh demands hate and the spirit is calling for love. And so I believe if we lovingly take our people into this century with regards to the power of the ballot and the power of love, we will further move Dr. King's beloved community. And I believe the beloved community is a reflection of the kingdom of God. Amen. Thank you, uh, Dr. Matthew. Appreciate that uh, so much. Going okay. tonight. Uh, Dr. Steve Rowans, uh, are you on there, Dr. Rowans? Yes, I'm here. Dr. Rowans, would you uh, tell us, uh, you know, where, where are you at with Dr. King and what's going on in the context today and your thoughts on uh, Dr. King? Okay, well, I'm on board with everything everyone has said. Uh, and uh, let me just say, I had the privilege of being at Glendale High School when he came to speak. And I remember, and I thought about when I watched and listened to Marvin last night, how there was a segment of people that were critical of him because of his approach to nonviolence. And as we know, by that time, Stokely and H. Rap Brown and others had risen up and were leading the uh, SNCC and doing what they were doing. And there was this tension that existed. And even when he came to Glenville, it was a packed house that day. There was those who you could hear the murmur in the crowd of all of us students. Here we are, young students. You could hear the murmur and the tension that was there. But by the time he finished speaking, he had won over several thousand students. And the thing that always resonated, resonates to, with me to this day is he told us, he talked about voting rights. He talked about equal rights. He talked about civil rights. But he said, if you're going to be a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper that ever lived on this earth. He talked about pride. He talked about love. He talked about peace. He talked about all the things we've been talking about today. And yesterday, I preached on love. And I preached on the courage of three kings, Martin Luther King, Rodney King, and the King of Kings. And Dr. King has always stuck with me as a great man, a man of grace, a man of power, and a man who led us to places we would never have been without him. And last but not least, piggybacking on what I heard Dr. Moss say today as well. When we look in the word of God, we see in times such as this, that God eventually reveals himself as he chooses to reveal himself and shows that he's all powerful. But as CJ also said, 
there's this reckoning, there's this judgment that comes. We see that in the Bible as well. Yes. But thank God, thank what you. follows all of this turmoil is something we know is deliverance. And I believe that God is still God and we will be delivered through all of this turmoil and mess if we continue to trust in him and love one another as we have been taught through the words of Jesus Christ and so many others that have gone before us, such as Dr. Martin Luther King. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Rowan. We're going we're gonna to put on Dr. Marvin McMickle. Dr. McMickle, are you here with us? If you can unmute your mic. Yes, sir, Brother President. I am, I am with you all, and good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Brother President. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus uh, says the following words to his disciples, which I think are completely applicable. Uh, in the life of Dr. King and in the life of all of us at this present time. Um, Jesus says to them, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Uh, I, I think about that word witness in three different ways, and I invite all of us to see Dr. King in that same way. Think about a witness, first of all, as someone who sees what is going on in the world around and is paying attention to what is happening. Does not turn his or her head away, does not try to ignore the events that are unfolding, does not try to act as if things are not moving at rapid pace. Uh, begin with the fact that what Dr. King and his generation, I might add, uh, was doing was seeing the injustices, seeing the inequities, seeing the uh, ways in which persons because of color and class were being denied equal opportunity. He saw things uh, beginning in his youth, as Dr. Moss could no doubt remind us, uh, as early as his teens, he was paying attention to the things that his, his own father was experiencing. He was paying attention to the things that even as a teenager in Atlanta, he had to deal with because of legalized segregation. My first challenge to all of us today is to find out whether or not we're paying attention. Whether we're seeing, as C.J. Matthews pointed out, um, not only what's happening in Washington, but what also what's happening with our white conservative brothers and sisters. Are we paying attention to the fact that we almost have two different gospels uh, almost have two different churches, almost have two different concepts of God. Um, when Franklin Graham uh, last week found the audacity, um, almost the ignorance to say that Republican lawmakers who voted um, not to uh, support the actions of those conservative Republicans that they, when they did that, it was as if they were like the disciples who betrayed Jesus. That somehow to support Donald Trump is the same as to support the will of God. We have to see what we're up against in order to fight back. The second sense of the word witness, brothers and sisters, is as in a courtroom <clears throat> where one is obligated to speak the truth about what one has seen. Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Dr. King was a truth teller. The truth about poverty, the truth about racism, the truth about war, the truth about the <clears throat> refusal of religious leaders to practice what they preach. Bear in mind, the letter from the Birmingham jail was a letter not written to you and me, but initially written in response to a clergyman in Birmingham who had a very sense of what the role of the church and what the role of the gospel, and in the case of the rabbi, what the role of religious faith was in those times. So that a, a preacher and a prophet is someone who sees what's going on, says the truth about what's going on. I want to give you a Greek word, if I could, uh, that helps me to understand this. I got this word from Cornell West in his book, um, in his discussion about Malcolm X, as a matter of fact, Cornel West said that uh, Malcolm X spoke with parhesia, 
P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A, parhesia, which means bold speech without regard for the consequences that may come to the speaker. Bold speech without regard to the consequences. You're not going to be a prophet if you don't have parhesia. You're not going to say much worth hearing if you are always afraid of the consequences of what you say so that you see something and then you say something. And then finally is the word in uh, Acts chapter one, verse eight. The real translation of that word witness in the Greek language is martyria. So Jesus says, be my martyria, which means be prepared to suffer something for the sake of what you have said. And there was in that video that we just saw in the life of Dr. King that we are now observing all three of these action steps. Dr. King was someone who saw the events going on in terms of racism, saw the events in terms of the impact of poverty, saw the events in terms of the way in which the Vietnam War was sucking up not just our nation's money, but the lives of our young people. He said something about what uh, he saw Remember, please, that his speech at Riverside Church about the Vietnam War was April the 4th, 1967. April the 4th, 1967. He was assassinated April the 4th, 1968. You cannot separate what he saw from what he said and then his willingness to suffer the consequences of bold speech. I invite all of us on this King Day to reassess these three steps in Acts chapter one, verse eight. Pay attention to what's happening in Washington right now. Pay attention to 25,000 soldiers deployed in our nation's capital to guarantee the peaceful transfer of power and all 50 capital cities on lockdown because people refuse to concede a political election. This is the last gasp breath of white supremacy, afraid to lose its ultimate control over the country. We have to see it. We have to have the courage to say something about what we have seen. We have to have parhesia, bold speech, without wondering whether or not in saying the truth, we might offend somebody or upset somebody. Truth requires boldness. And if people cannot accept it, uh, we have to then live with step three, which is be prepared to suffer something for the sake of what you have said because of what you have seen. That was Jesus's invitation to his disciples then. That is his invitation to disciples now. Be my witness in Jerusalem, the city where you live, Judea, the country where you live, Samaria, among whoever your those people are. All of us have some group that we view as other than us. The love of God cannot simply be uh, reserved for the folk that we like and who like us. We have to break down some walls and tear down some barriers uh, and enter into some alliances with Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. Uh, I'll close with this, Brother President. As I've often said, I do not think that God's favorite hymn is God Bless America. In fact, I don't think that God has that song in the heavenly hymn book at all, because God is neither an American nor particularly interested in one nation over any other. I think instead that, that God's favorite hymn is a song of our ancestors when they said, he's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Be my witness. Seeing something, saying something, suffering something in Jerusalem where you live, in Judea where you live, in Samaria where you venture to go, and in the whole of God's creation because God has the whole world in his hands. Dr. King saw that then, we must see that today. Amen. Thank you, Dr. McMichael, for that. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, it uh, we thank you for uh, all of you who are here today. Dr. Miner. Yes, thank you. I'm here. Yes, thank you. Thank you for um, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and I'm 
very, very sorry. I uh, had a had a crisis, something come up that got in the way. But it sounds like uh, you had uh, three or four, and I see who was on the call. There were great words. Uh, I am certain that um, there isn't uh, much that um, I could have said or added that would have enhanced the show. Um, I do want to say, and Dr. Moss was one of the ones that pointed out to me years ago, is that while many people celebrate Martin Luther King Day as a day of community service, which is fine and wonderful, but we also know that Dr. King was more than just feeding the hungry and, and painting walls and doing all of those things, and that the things that we do as United Pastors of engaging in social change engaging in public policy is important. And also Dr. King's uh, word about love over hate, uh, uh, brotherhood over racism, uh, nonviolence as a tool for social change is something that I wish all of the folk who stormed the Capitol, I wish that they had got to know King, uh, regardless of whatever one's um, whatever one is fighting for, nonviolence is always the best tool. Yes. And so we just uh, celebrate King in that spirit, that civil disobedience in a nonviolent, creative way was King's message. And it is most relevant today. Thank you and God bless you. Yes. Uh, Dr. Stitt, would you give us uh, closing remarks? And we certainly hope that everybody will go in prayer for the next uh, days. I've asked my church uh, our church to uh, pray every day at 12 o'clock and to, uh, you know, with this uh, violent uh, violence that's uh, being perpetrated around the nation, the country, we want peace. Um, and so we need to pray every day for that. We prayed in uh, December and I could tell you a massive things that happened across the nation uh, politically and uh, and other otherwise that happened uh, because of your prayer. So I thank you very much. We will not be having our meeting on tomorrow. This has replaced that. Uh, Dr. Sid, you want to give us some closing remarks on Dr. King and uh, give us a closing prayer? I just want to thank uh, Dr. McMickle and Dr. Moss for what they have told us today. Um, also, Steve Rowan, who gave us some very good remarks about his youth and seeing and hearing Dr. King. Uh, but most of all, I want to thank you, Bishop Macon, for what you're doing and how you've brought this to all of us today. Yes, we're celebrating Dr. King. And one of the things that I just want to just reiterate is the love that he has asked us to show one another. And sometimes it's difficult to show love in the midst of hate. But this is what Jesus had done. So I guess Jesus expect nothing less of us. But once again, thank you so much for what we have heard today. Dr. Stitt, will you close us in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Most gracious Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate a man, Dr. King, whose message even resonate today. Lord, we thank you for those who have given us words of wisdom today and who have reminded us of so many things that Dr. King, messages that Dr. King has left. We also thank you for Dr. C.J. Matthews, Heavenly Father, who's been a stalwart in this community. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will continue to wrap your loving arms around Bishop Macon. Lord, we know that you're using him and that, that you're giving him the wisdom and the knowledge to impart upon us. So God, we ask that you will continue to, to hold him in the palm of your hands so that he will continue to lead us in whatever direction you would have us to go. And once again, oh God, we thank you for all those who have spoken today. We thank you for their wisdom. We thank you for their knowledge. And we thank you for what they have imparted to us today. This we ask in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, amen. Amen. Brothers, God bless you. Y'all have a great day. Happy Martin Luther King Day. And thank all of you.